Mercurochrome. Padma our plump Padma is sulking magnificently. She can't read and, like all fish lovers, dislikes other people knowing anything she doesn't. Padma, strong, jolly, a consolation for my last days. But definitely a bitch in the manger. She attempts to cajole me from my desk, eat, nah, food is spoiling. I remain stubbornly hunched over paper. But what is so precious, Padma demands, her right hand slicing the air up down up in exasperation, to need all this writing shitting. I reply, now that I've let out the details of my birth, now that the perforated sheet stands between doctor and patient, there's no going back. Padma snorts. Wrist smacks against forehead. Okay, starve starve, who cares 2 ps. Another louder, conclusive snort, but I take no exception to her attitude. She stirs a bubbling vat all day for a living, something hot and vinegary has steamed her up tonight. Thick of waist, somewhat hairy of forearm, she flounces, gesticulates, exits. Poor Padma. Things are always getting her goat. Perhaps even her name, understandably enough, since her mother told her, when she was only small, that she had been named after the Lotus Goddess, whose most common appellation amongst village folk is, the one who possesses dung. In the renewed silence, I return to sheets of paper which smell just a little of turmeric, ready and willing to put out of its misery a narrative which I left yesterday hanging in mid-air just as Scheherazade, depending for her very survival on leaving Prince Sharyar eaten up by curiosity, used to do night after night. I'll begin at once, by revealing that my grandfather's premonitions in the corridor were not without foundation. In the succeeding months and years, he fell under what I can only describe as the sorcerer's spell of that enormous and as yet unstained perforated cloth. Again. Adam's mother said, rolling her eyes. I tell you, my child, that girl is so sickly from too much soft living only. Too much sweet meats and spoiling, because of the absence of a mother's firm hand. But go, take care of your invisible patient, your mother is alright with her little nothing of a headache. In those years, you see, the landowner's daughter Nassim Ghani contracted a quite extraordinary number of minor illnesses, and each time a Shirkara Walla was dispatched to summon the tall young Dr. Sahib with the big nose who was making such a reputation for himself in the valley. Adam Aziza's visits to the bedroom with the shaft of sunlight and the three lady wrestlers became weekly events, and on each occasion he was vouchsafed a glimpse, through the mutilated sheet, of a different seven-inch circle of the young woman's body. Her initial stomachache was succeeded by a very slightly twisted right ankle, an ingrowing toenail on the big toe of the left foot, a tiny cut on the lower left calf. Tetanus is a killer, Dr. Sahib, the landowner said, my Nassim must not die for a scratch. There was the matter of her stiff right knee, which the doctor was obliged to manipulate through the hole in the sheet, and after a time the illnesses leapt upwards, avoiding certain unmentionable zones, and began to proliferate around her upper half. She suffered from something mysterious which her father called finger rot, which made the skin flake off her hands, from weakness of the wrist bones, for which Adam prescribed calcium tablets, and from attacks of constipation, for which he gave her a course of laxatives, since there was no question of being permitted to administer an enema. She had fevers and she also had subnormal temperatures. At these times his thermometer would be placed under her armpit and he would hum and haw about the relative inefficiency of the method. In the opposite armpit she once developed a slight case of tinea chloris and he dusted her with yellow powder, after this treatment which required him to rub the powder in, gently but firmly, although the soft secret body began to shake and quiver and he heard helpless laughter coming through the sheet, because Nassim Ghani was very ticklish the itching went away, but Nassim soon I found a new set of complaints. 
She waxed anemic in the summer and bronchial in the winter. Her tubes are most delicate, Ghani explained, like little flutes. Far away the Great War moved from crisis to crisis, while in the cobwebbed house Dr. Aziz was also engaged in a total war against his section patients' inexhaustible complaints. And, in all those war years, Nassim never repeated an illness. Which only shows, Ghani told Imam, that you are a good doctor. When you cure, she is cured for good. But alas! He struck his forehead she pines for her late mother, poor baby, and her body suffers. She is a too loving child. So gradually Dr. Aziz came to have a picture of Nassim in his mind, a badly fitting collage of her severally inspected parts. This phantasm of a partitioned woman began to haunt him, and not only in his dreams. Glued together by his imagination, she accompanied him on all his rounds, she moved into the front room of his mind, so that waking and sleeping he could feel in his fingertips the softness of her ticklish skin or the perfect tiny wrists or the beauty of the ankles, he could smell her scent of lavender and shambili, he could hear her voice and her helpless laughter of a little girl, but she was headless, because he had never seen her face. His mother by on her bed, spread-eagled on her stomach. Come, come and press me, she said, my doctor son whose fingers can soothe his old mother's muscles. Press, press, my child with his expression of a constipated goose. He needed her shoulders. She grunted, twitched, relaxed. Lower now, she said, now higher. To the right. Good. My brilliant son who cannot see what that Ghani landowner is doing. So clever, my child, but he doesn't guess why that girl is forever ill with her piffling disorders. Listen, my boy, see the nose on your face for once, that Ghani thinks you are a good catch for her. Foreign educated and all. I have worked in shops and been undressed by the eyes of strangers so that you should marry that Nassim. Of course I am right, otherwise why would he look twice at our family? Aziz pressed his mother. Oh God, stop now, no need to kill me because I tell you the truth. By 1918, Adam Aziz had come to live for his regular trips across the lake. And now his eagerness became even more intense, because it became clear that, after three years, the landowner and his daughter had become willing to lower certain barriers. Now, for the first time, Ghani said, a lump in the right chest. Is it worrying, doctor? Look. Look well. And there, framed in the hole, was a perfectly formed and lyrically lovely. I must touch it, Aziz said, fighting with his voice. Ghani slapped him on the back. Touch, touch, he cried, the hands of the healer. The curing touch, eh, doctor. And Aziz reached out a hand. Forgive me for asking, but is it the ladies' time of the month? Little secret smiles appearing on the faces of the lady wrestlers. Ghani, nodding affably, yes. Don't be so embarrassed, old chap. We are family and doctor now. And Aziz, then don't worry. The lumps will go when the time ends. And the next time, a pulled muscle in the back of her thigh, Dr. Sahib. Such pain. And there, in the sheet, weakening the eyes of Adam Aziz, hung a superbly rounded and impossible buttock. And now Aziz, is it permitted that? Whereupon a word from Ghani, an obedient reply from behind the sheet, a drawstring pulled, and pajamas fall from the celestial rump, which swells wondrously through the hole. Adam Aziz forces himself into a medical frame of mind, reaches out, feels, and swears to himself, in amazement, that he sees the bottom reddening in a shy, but compliant blush. That evening, Adam contemplated the blush. 
Did the magic of the sheet work on both sides of the hole? Excitedly, he envisaged his headless Nassim tingling beneath the scrutiny of his eyes, his thermometer, his stethoscope, his fingers, and trying to build a picture in her mind of him. She was at a disadvantage, of course, having seen nothing but his hands. Adam began to hope with an illicit desperation for Nassim Ghani to develop a migraine or graze her unseen chin, so they could look each other in the face. He knew how unprofessional his feelings were, but did nothing to stifle them. There was not much he could do. They had acquired a life of their own. In short, my grandfather had fallen in love, and had come to think of the perforated sheet as something sacred and magical, because through it he had seen the things which had filled up the hole inside him which had been created when he had been hit on the nose by a tussock and insulted by the boatman Tai. On the day the World War ended, Nassim developed the long-for headache. Such historical coincidences have littered, and perhaps befouled, my family's existence in the world. He hardly dared to look at what was framed in the hole in the sheet. Maybe she was hideous, perhaps that explained all this performance, he looked. And saw a soft face that was not at all ugly, a cushioned setting for her glittering, gemstone eyes, which were brown with flecks of gold, tiger's eyes. Dr. Aziza's fall was complete. And Nassim burst out, but doctor, my god, what a nose. Ghani, angrily, daughter, mind your. But patient and doctor were laughing together, and Aziz was saying, yes, yes, it is a remarkable specimen. They tell me there are dynasties waiting in it. And he bit his tongue because he had been about to add, like snot. And Ghani, who had stood blindly beside the sheet for three long years, smiling and smiling and smiling, began once again to smile his secret smile, which was mirrored in the lips of the wrestlers. Meanwhile, the boatman, Tai, had taken his unexplained decision to give up washing. In a valley drenched in freshwater lakes, where even the very poorest people could, and did, pride themselves on their cleanliness, Tai chose to stink. For three years now, he had neither bathed nor washed himself after answering calls of nature. He wore the same clothes, unwashed, year in, year out, his one concession to winter was to put his chuga coat over his putrescent pajamas. The little basket of hot coals which he carried inside the chuga, in the Kashmiri fashion, to keep him warm in the bitter cold, only animated and accentuated his evil odors. He took to drifting slowly past the Aziz household, releasing the dreadful fumes of his body across the small garden and into the house. Flowers died, birds fled from the ledge outside old father Aziz's window. Naturally, Tai lost work, the English in particular were reluctant to be ferried by a human cesspit. The story went around the lake that Tai's wife, driven to distraction by the old man's sudden filthiness, pleaded for a reason. He had answered, ask our foreign return doctor, ask that Naku, that German Aziz, was it, then, an attempt to offend the doctor's hypersensitive nostrils, in which the itch of danger had subsided somewhat under the anesthetizing ministrations of love. Or a gesture of unchangingness in defiance of the invasion of the doctoriata Shea from Heidelberg. Once Aziz asked the ancient, straight out, what it was all for, but Tai only breathed on him and rode away. The breath nearly fell Aziz, it was sharp as an axe. In 1918, Dr. Aziz's father, deprived of his birds, died in his sleep, and at once his mother, who had been able to sell the gemstone business thanks to the success of Aziz's practice, and who now saw her husband's death as a merciful release for her from a life filled with responsibilities, took to her own deathbed and followed her man before the end of his own 40-day mourning period. By the time the Indian regiments returned at the end of the war, Dr. Aziz was an orphan, and a free man except that his heart had fallen through a hole some seven inches across. 
Desolating effect of Ty's behavior, it ruined Dr. Aziz's good relations with the lake's floating population. He, who as a child had chatted freely with fishwives and flower sellers, found himself looked at askance. Ask that Naku, that German Aziz. Ty had branded him as an alien, and therefore a person not completely to be trusted. They didn't like the boatman, but they found the transformation which the doctor had evidently worked upon him even more disturbing. Aziz found himself suspected, even ostracized, by the poor, and it hurt him badly. Now he understood what Ty was up to, the man was trying to chase him out of the valley. The story of the perforated sheet got out, too. The lady wrestlers were evidently less discreet than they looked. Aziz began to notice people pointing at him. Women giggled behind their palms. I've decided to give Ty his victory, he said. The three lady wrestlers, two holding up the sheet, the third hovering near the door, strained to hear him through the cotton wool in their ears. I made my father do it, Nassim told him, these Chatterjees won't do any more of their tittling and tattling from now on. Nassim's eyes, whole framed, became wider than ever. Just like his own when, a few days earlier, he had been walking the city streets, had seen the last bus of the winter arrive, painted with its colorful inscriptions on the front, God willing in green shadowed and red, on the back, blue shadowed yellow crying thank God, and in cheeky maroon, sorry bye bye, and had recognized, through a web of new rings and lines on her face, Ike Lubin as she descended. Nowadays, Ghani the landowner left him alone with earplugged guardians, to talk a little, the doctor-patient relationship can only deepen in strictest confidentiality. I see that now, Aziz Sahib forgive my earlier intrusions. Nowadays, Nassim's tongue was getting freer all the time. What kind of talk is this? What are you a man or a mouse? To leave home because of a stinky Shakara man. Oscar died, Ilsa told him, sipping fresh lime water on his mother's top. Like a comedian. He went to talk to the army and tell them not to be pawns. The fool really thought the troops would fling down their guns and walk away. We watched from a window and I prayed they wouldn't just trample all over him. The regiment had learned to march and step by then, you wouldn't recognize them. As he reached the street corner across from the parade ground he tripped over his own shoelace and fell into the street. A staff car hit him and he died. He could never keep his laces tied, that ninny, here there were diamonds freezing in her lashes. He was the type that gives anarchists a bad name. All right, Nassim conceded, so you've got a good chance of landing a good job. Agra University, it's a famous place, don't think I don't know. University doctor. Sounds good. Say you're going for that, and it's a different business. Eyelashes drooped in the hole. I will miss you, naturally. I'm in love, Adam Aziz said to Ilsa Lubin. And later. So I've only seen her through a hole in a sheet, one part at a time, and I swear her bottom blushes. They must be putting something in the air up here, you said. Nassim, I've got the job. Adam said excitedly. The letter came today. With effect from April 1919. Your father says he can find a buyer for my house and the gemstone shop also. Wonderful, Nassim pouted. So now I must find a new doctor. Or maybe I'll get that old hag again who didn't know two things about anything. Because I am an orphan, Dr. Aziz said. I must come myself in place of my family members. But I have come nevertheless, Ghani Sahib, for the first time without being sent for. This is not a professional visit. Dear boy. Ghani, clapping Adam on the back. Of course you must marry her. With an A, 
one fine dowry. No expense spared. It will be the wedding of the year, oh most certainly, yes. I cannot leave you behind when I go, Aziz said to Nassim. Ghani said, enough of this Tamasha. No more need for this sheet tomfoolery. Drop it down, you women, these are young lovers now. At last, said Adam Aziz, I see you whole at last. But I must go now. My rounds, and an old friend is staying with me, I must tell her, she will be very happy for us both. A dear friend from Germany. No, Adam Baba, his bearer said, since the morning I have not seen Ilsa Begum. She hired that old Thai to go for a Shirkara ride. What can be said, sir? Thai mumbled meekly. I am honored indeed to be summoned into the home of a so great personage as yourself. Sir, the lady hired me for a trip to the Mogul Gardens, to do it before the lake freezes. A quiet lady, Dr. Sahib, not one word out of her all the time. So I was thinking my own unworthy private thoughts as old fools will and suddenly when I look she is not in her seat. Sahib, on my wife's head I swear it, it is not possible to see over the back of the seat, how was I to tell? Believe a poor old boatman who was your friend when you were young. Adam Baba, the old bearer interrupted, excuse me but just now I have found this paper on her table. I know where she is, Dr. Aziz stared at Ty. I don't know how you keep getting mixed up in my life, but you showed me the place once. You said, certain foreign women come here to drown. I, Sahib. Ty shocked, malodorous, innocent. But grief is making your head play trick. How can I know these things? And after the body, bloated, wrapped in weeds, had been dredged up by a group of blank-faced boatmen, Ty visited the Shirkara halt and told the men there, as they recoiled from his breath of a bullock with dysentery, he blames me, only imagine. Brings his loose Europeans here and tells me it is my fault when they jump into the lake. I ask, how did he know just where to look? Yes, ask him that, ask that Naku Aziz. She had left a note. It read, I didn't mean it. I make no comment, these events, which have tumbled from my lips any old how, garbled by haste and emotion, are for others to judge. Let me be direct now, and say that during the long, hard winter of 1918-19, Ty fell ill, contracting a violent skin disease, akin to that European curse called the King's Evil, but he refused to see Dr. Aziz and was treated by a local homeopath. And in March, when the lake thawed, a marriage took place in a large marquee in the grounds of Ghani the landowner's house. The wedding contract assured Adam Aziz of a respectable sum of money, which would help buy a house in Agra, and the dowry included, at Dr. Aziz's especial request, a certain mutilated bedsheet. The young couple sat on a dais, garlanded and cold, while the guests filed past dropping rupees into their laps. That night my grandfather placed the perforated sheet beneath his bride and himself and in the morning it was adorned by three drops of blood, which formed a small triangle. In the morning, the sheet was displayed, and after the consummation ceremony a limousine hired by the landowner arrived to drive my grandparents to Amritsar, where they would catch the frontier mail. Mountains crowded round and stared as my grandfather left his home for the last time. He would return, once, but not to leave. Aziz thought he saw an ancient boatman standing on land to watch them pass but it was probably a mistake, since Tai was ill. The blister of a temple atop Sankara Acharya, which Muslims had taken to calling the Takti Sulaiman, or Seat of Solomon, paid them no attention. Winter bare poplars and snow-covered fields of saffron undulated around them as the car drove south, with an old leather bag containing, amongst other things, a stethoscope and a bedsheet, packed in the boot. Dr. Aziz felt, 
in the pit of his stomach, a sensation akin to weightlessness. Or falling. And now I am cast as a ghost. I am nine years old and the whole family, my father, my mother, the brass monkey and myself, are staying at my grandparents' house in Agra, and the grandchildren myself among them are staging the customary New Year's play, and I have been cast as a ghost. Accordingly and surreptitiously so as to preserve the secrets of the forthcoming theatricals I am ransacking the house for a spectral disguise. My grandfather is out and about his rounds. I am in his room. And here on top of this cupboard is an old trunk, covered in dust and spiders, but unlocked. And here, inside it, is the answer to my prayers. Not just a sheet, but one with a hole already cut in it. Here it is, inside this leather bag inside this trunk, right beneath an old stethoscope and a tube of mildewed Vicks inhaler, the sheet's appearance in our show was nothing less than a sensation. My grandfather took one look at it and rose roaring to his feet. He strode up on stage and unhosted me right in front of everyone. My grandmother's lips were so tightly pursed they seemed to disappear. Between them, the one booming at me in the voice of a forgotten boatman, the other conveying her fury through vanished lips, they reduced the awesome ghost to a weeping wreck. I fled, took to my heels and ran into the little cornfield, not knowing what had happened. I sat there perhaps on the very spot on which Nadir Khan had sat, for several hours, swearing over and over that I would never again open a forbidden trunk, and feeling vaguely resentful that it had not been locked in the first place. But I knew, from their rage, that the sheet was somehow very important indeed. I have been interrupted by Padma, who brought me my dinner and then withheld it, blackmailing me, so if you're going to spend all your time wrecking your eyes with that scribbling, at least you must read it to me. I have been singing for my supper but perhaps our Padma will be useful, because it's impossible to stop her being a critic. She is particularly angry with my remarks about her name. What do you know, city boy, she cried hand slicing the air. In my village there is no shame in being named for the dung goddess. Write at once that you are wrong, completely. In accordance with my lotus's wishes, I insert, forthwith, a brief pian to dung. Dung, that fertilizes and causes the crops to grow. Dung, which is patted into thin chapati-like cakes when still fresh and moist, and is sold to the village builders, who use it to secure and strengthen the walls of Kachcha buildings made of mud. Dung, whose arrival from the nether end of cattle goes a long way towards explaining their divine and sacred status. Oh, yes, I was wrong, I admit I was prejudiced, no doubt because its unfortunate odors do have a way of offending my sensitive nose how wonderful, how ineffably lovely it must be to be named for the purveyor of dung. On April 6, 1919, the holy city of Amritsar smelled, gloriously, Padma, celestially, of excrement. And perhaps the, the beauteous, reek did not offend the nose on my grandfather's face after all, Kashmir. Peasants used it, as described above, for a kind of plaster. Even in Srinagar, hawkers with barrows of round dung cakes were not an uncommon sight. But then the stuff was drying, muted, useful. Amritsar dung was fresh and, worse, redundant. Nor was it all bovine. It issued from the rumps of the horses between the shafts of the city's many tongas, ikas, and garis, and mules and men and dogs attended nature's calls, mingling in a brotherhood of shit. But there were cows, too, sacred kine roaming the dusty streets, each patrolling its own territory, staking its claims in excrement. And flies. Public enemy number one, buzzing gaily from turd to steaming turd, celebrated and cross-pollinated these freely given offerings. The city swarmed about, too, mirroring the motion of the flies. 
Dr. Aziz looked down from his hotel window onto this scene as a Jane in a face mask walked past, brushing the pavement before him with a twig broom, to avoid stepping on an ant, or even a fly. Spicy sweet fumes rose from a street snack barrel. Hot pakoras, pakoras hot. A white woman was buying silks from a shop across the street and men in turbans were ogling her. Nassim now Nassim Aziz had a sharp headache, it was the first time she'd ever repeated an illness, but life outside her quiet valley had come as something of a shock to her. There was a jug of fresh lime water by her bed, emptying rapidly. Aziz stood at the window, inhaling the city. The spire of the golden temple gleamed in the sun. But his nose itched, something was not right here. Close up of my grandfather's right hand, nails knuckles fingers all somehow bigger than you'd expect. Clumps of red hair on the outside edges. Thumb and forefinger pressed together, separated only by a thickness of paper. In short, my grandfather was holding a pamphlet. It had been inserted into his hand, we cut to a long shot nobody from Bombay should be without a basic film vocabulary as he entered the hotel foyer. Scurrying of urchin through revolving door, leaflets falling in his wake, as the chaprassi gives chase. Mad revolutions in the doorway, round and round, until chaprassi hand demands a close-up, too, because it is pressing thumb to forefinger, the two separated only by the thickness of urchin ear. Ejection of juvenile disseminator of gutter tracts, but still my grandfather retained the message. Now, looking out of his window, he sees it echoed on a wall opposite, and there, on the minaret of a mosque, and in the large black type of newsprint under a hawker's arm. Leaflet newspaper mosque and wall are crying, Hartal. Which is to say, literally speaking, a day of mourning, of stillness, of silence. But this is India in the heyday of the Mahatma, when even language obeys the instructions of Gandhiji, and the word has acquired, under his influence, new resonances. Hartal April 7, a green mosque newspaper wall and pamphlet, because Gandhi has decreed that the whole of India shall, on that day, come to a halt. To mourn, in peace, the continuing presence of the British. I do not understand this Hartal when nobody is dead, Nassim is crying softly. Why will the train not run? How long are we stuck for? Dr. Aziz notices a soldierly young man in the street, and thinks the Indians have fought for the British, so many of them have seen the world by now, and been tainted by abroad. They will not easily go back to the old world. The British are wrong to try and turn back the clock. It was a mistake to pass the Rolat Act, he murmurs. What Rolat, wails Nassim. This is nonsense where I'm concerned. Against political agitation, Aziz explains, and returns to his thoughts. Tai once said, Kashmiris are different. Cowards, for instance. Put a gun in a Kashmiri's hand and it will have to go off by itself he'll never dare to pull the trigger. We are not like Indians, always making battles. Aziz, with tie in his head, does not feel Indian. Kashmir, after all, is not strictly speaking a part of the empire, but an independent princely state. He is not sure if the Hartal of pamphlet mosque wall newspaper is his fight, even though he is in occupied territory now. He turns from the window. To see Nassim weeping into a pillow. She has been weeping ever since he asked her, on their second night, to move a little. Move where? she asked. Move how? He became awkward and said, only move, I mean, like a woman. She shrieked in horror. My God, what have I married? I know you Europe returned men. You find terrible women and then you try to make us girls be like them. Listen, Dr. Sahib, husband or no husband, I am not any, 
bad word woman, this was a battle my grandfather never won, and it set the tone for their marriage, which rapidly developed into a place of frequent and devastating warfare, under whose depredations the young girl behind the sheet and the gauche young doctor turned rapidly into different, stranger beings. What now, wife? Aziz asks. Nassim buries her face in the pillow. What else, she says in muffled tones. You, or what? You want me to walk naked in front of strange men. He has told her to come out of Perda. He says, your shirt covers you from neck to wrist to knee. Your loose pajamas hide you down to and including your ankles. What we have left are your feet and face. Wife, are your face and feet obscene? But she wails, they will see more than that. They will see my deep deep shame. And now an accident, which launches us into the world of Mercurochrome. Aziz, finding his temper slipping from him, drags all his wife's perda veils from her suitcase, flings them into a waste paper basket made of tin with a painting of Guru Nanak on the side, and sets fire to them. Flames leap up, taking him by surprise, licking at curtains. Adam rushes to the door and yells for help as the cheap curtains begin to blaze, and bearers guests washerwomen stream into the room and flap at dye burning fabric with dusters towels and other people's laundry. Buckets are brought, the fire goes out, and Nassim cowers on the bed as about 35 Sikhs, Hindus and untouchables throng in the smoke-filled room. Finally they leave, and Nassim unleashes two sentences before clamping her lips obstinately shut. You are a madman. I want more lime water. My grandfather opens the windows, turns to his bride. The smoke will take time to go, I will take a walk. Are you coming? Lips clamped, eyes squeezed, a single violent no from the head, and my grandfather goes into the streets alone. His parting shot, forget about being a good Kashmiri girl. Start thinking about being a modern Indian woman. While in the cantonment area, at British Army HQ, one Brigadier R. E. Dyer is waxing his mustache. It is April 7, 1919, and in Amritsar the Mahatma's grand design is being distorted. The shops have shut, the railway station is closed but now rioting mobs are breaking them up. Dr. Aziz, leather bag in hand, is out in the streets, giving help wherever possible. Trampled bodies have been left where they fell. He is bandaging wounds, dobing them liberally with mercurochrome, which makes them look bloodier than ever, but at least disinfects them. Finally he returns to his hotel room, his clothes soaked in red stains, and Nassim commences a panic. Let me help, let me help, Allah what a man I've married, who goes into gullies to fight with Gundas. She is all over him with water on wads of cotton wool. I don't know why can't you be a respectable doctor like ordinary people are just cure important illnesses and all. God you've got blood everywhere. Sit, sit now, let me wash you at least. It isn't blood, wife. You think I can't see for myself with my own eyes? Why must you make a fool of me even when you're hurt? Must your wife not look after you, even? It's mercurochrome, Nassim. Red medicine. Nassim who had become a whirlwind of activity, seizing clothes, running taps freezes. You do it on purpose, she says, to make me look stupid. I am not stupid. I have read several books. It is April 13th, and they are still in Amritsar. This affair isn't finished, Adam Aziz told Nassim. We can't go, you see, they may need doctors again. So we must sit here and wait until the end of the world. He rubbed his nose. No, not so long, I am afraid. That afternoon, the streets are suddenly full of people, all moving in the same direction, 
defying Dyer's new martial law regulations. Adam tells Nassim, there must be a meeting plan there will be trouble from the military. They have banned meetings. Why do you have to go? Why not wait to be called? A compound can be anything from a wasteland to a park. The largest compound in Amritsar is called Jallianwala Bog. It is not grassy. Stones, cans, glass and other things are everywhere. To get into it, you must walk down a very narrow alleyway between two buildings. On April 13, many thousands of Indians are crowding through this alleyway. It is peaceful protest, someone tells Dr. Aziz. Swept along by the crowds, he arrives at the mouth of the alley. A bag from Heidelberg is in his right hand. No close-up is necessary. He is, I know, feeling very scared, because his nose is itching worse than it ever has, but he is a trained doctor, he puts it out of his mind, he enters the compound. Somebody is making a passionate speech. Hawkers move through the crowd selling chana and sweetmeats. The air is filled with dust. There do not seem to be any gundas, any trouble, makers, as far as my grandfather can see. A group of Sikhs has spread a cloth on the ground and is eating, seated around it. There is still a smell of ordure in the air. Aziz penetrates the heart of the crowd, as Brigadier or Dyer arrives at the entrance to the alleyway, followed by 50 crack troops. He is the martial law commander of Amritsar an important man, after all, the wax tips of his mustache are rigid with importance. As the 51 men march down the alleyway a tickle replaces the itch in my grandfather's nose. The 51 men enter the compound and take up positions, 25 to Dyer's right and 25 to his left, and Adam Aziz ceases to concentrate on the events around him as the tickle mounts to unbearable intensities. As Brigadier Dyer issues a command the sneeze hits my grandfather full in the face. Yakak Tij, he sneezes and falls forward, losing his balance, following his nose and thereby saving his life. His doctoriata shape flies open, bottles, liniment and syringes scatter in the dust. He is scrabbling furiously at people's feet, trying to save his equipment before it is crushed. There is a noise like teeth chattering in winter and someone falls on him. Red stuff stains his shirt. There are screams now and sobs and the strange chattering continues. More and more people seem to have stumbled and fallen on top of my grandfather. He becomes afraid for his back. The clasp of his bag is digging into his chest, inflicting upon it a bruise so severe and mysterious that it will not fade until after his death, years later, on the hill of Sankara Acharya or Takti Suleiman. His nose is jammed against a bottle of red pills. The chattering stops and is replaced by the noises of people and birds. There seems to be no traffic noise whatsoever. Brigadier Dyer's 50 men put down their machine guns and go away. They have fired a total of 1,650 rounds into the unarmed crowd. Of these, 1,516 have found their mark, killing or wounding some person. Good shooting, Dyer tells his men, we have done a jolly good thing. When my grandfather got home that night, my grandmother was trying hard to be a modern woman, to please him, and so she did not turn a hair at his appearance. I see you've been spilling the mercurochrome again, clumsy, she said, appeasingly. It's blood, he replied, and she fainted. When he brought her round with the help of a little sal volatile, she said, are you hurt? No, he said. But where have you been, my god? Nowhere on earth, he said and began to shake in her arms. My own hand, I confess, has begun to wobble, not entirely because of its theme, but because I have noticed a thin crack, like a hair, appearing in my wrist, beneath the skin. No matter. 
We all owe death a life. So let me conclude with the uncorroborated rumor that the boatman Tai, who recovered from his scrofulous infection soon after my grandfather left Kashmir, did not die until 1947, when, the story goes, he was infuriated by India and Pakistan's struggle over his valley, and walked to Cham with the express purpose of standing between the opposing forces and giving them a piece of his mind. Kashmiri for the Kashmiris, that was his line. Naturally, they shot him. Oscar Lubin would probably have approved of his rhetorical gesture, R.E. Dyer might have commended his murderer's rifle skills. I must go to bed. Padma is waiting, and I need a little warmth. If you like this video please like share and subscribe.